Every day, a small city of people visit SeaWorld Orlando. And they're not just here for the entertainment. They want to eat. That's a 24-hour job for the park's culinary team. It's tough at times. There are over 60 food outlets, and one handles over 1,000 people an hour. The biggest, the baddest restaurant in the park. It takes 1,200 people, working 365 days per year. Probably biggest challenge is just staffing. Find out how they do it as we go behind the scenes for 24 hours. Do I got a big cheese? In the kitchens at SeaWorld Orlando. Spike Donald on the grill. Runners! Yeah, I can leave Brennan here to keep going. I'll deliver. SeaWorld Orlando is more than just fun in the Florida sun. It's a culinary experience. Behind the scenes of this theme park, an army of staff feed thousands of people every single day. On a daily basis, we can feed upwards to 12,000 meals a day. Easy, that's just meals. It's massive, the, the number of restaurants that we have in this park. In any given hour, we can feed 5,000 meals. Kathy Valeriano is head of the park's culinary department. Total at the park here, we're about 1,200 total team members. We're the largest department of the, of the SeaWorld parks here in Orlando. You need these things for under her command are 13 restaurants, over 50 kiosks, and a host of speciality dining. There's really no place in the park that you can't eat. But she doesn't do the job alone. She has a top-class team running her kitchens. Chefs are critical to our operation. Without it, you know, the chef experience, the knowledge behind it, it's about quality and it's about making sure that we have the right presentation. And really, ultimately, they're there to mentor our prep cooks and our line cooks. And they do a great job. You have to have somebody running your kitchen operation. And, uh, you know, we have an executive chef that oversees all of our kitchen operations. And he does a fantastic job maintaining that ship uh, in the park. Runners! You got a filet mignon rare coming up? Do I got a big cheese? The man in charge is executive chef Hector Colon. I would say the theme park is a little bit different from a restaurant because we get so many people from everywhere. We get different cultures, so we have to accommodate. We do a lot of food. Yeah, we do a little bit of everything. You know, a lot of people think that you go to the theme park, you're going to eat hamburgers and hot dogs. And I said, no, come over here. Have a good meal. If I'm gonna sell you a hamburger and a hot dog, you gotta be the best hamburger and a hot dog. And one of his kitchens handles more than most. Voyages. The biggest, the baddest restaurant in the park. Thousand meals per hour, four cafeteria lines, center of the park, um, you know, seats 700 people at any given time. Voyages' popularity stems from its main ingredient. Barbecue. You smell it as soon as you walk into to the gates of the park. You know, people are searching for that barbecue. And there's no hurrying perfection. So one he needs to go down and take over for chef. It's a hustle and bustle. I mean, there's a preparation going on all day long. You okay? Let's do to your foot. That 24-hour preparation starts in the middle of the night. The park is closed, but the ovens are still hot. At midnight, we are actually smoking our brisket in the park. Uh, all of our smoked fo foods are loaded in before we go home. We take uh, basically three or four types of meats. We have our baby back ribs, our pork uh, spare ribs. We have our uh, chicken as well as our brisket that we cook here. It is all smoked. We do a 
10 hour enduring process for our brisket, which at the end of the day comes out very mouth watering and it melts in your mouth. The smokehouse team are not the only ones working a night shift. Three hours into the day, and the bakery has its hands full. It's not just guests that get first-class meals. The park's residents have their own catering team. It's 3 a.m. and Supervisor JP opens the Marine Canteen. He has just three hours to deliver the day's feed. You're looking at about 2,700 to 3,000 pounds of fish each morning that Two of our team members actually come in, prepare, and put in every bucket you see here. And once we get them in, it doesn't stop there. You got to pick them all up and start getting them to the truck and get them out of here as quick as we can. We need to have everything pretty much delivered throughout the park by 6 o'clock. With just three staff on duty, it's a small team with a big responsibility. And the only way to do it right is by hand. Actually, digging through them by hand helps us to see if there's anything else in the fish that we don't want. Um, you know, these fish are caught and processed very quickly. So sometimes you'll find that there's a little bit of plastic, there might be a little bit of line in there. You might even find a fish that has a hook in it. By moving them all by hand, we're actually able to see all the fish as we turn them in the bucket. So if something doesn't look right, you can pull that fish and figure out what's going on. And that's roughly 1,200 pounds of herring. It's too early in the morning, isn't it? The pace doesn't stop until it's all delivered. Once it's all delivered, then we got to come back, get everything cleaned up in here. Wayne, you got scissors? That's a heck of a hop. All right. So, Wayne, we're going to start bucketing while you finish racking the cape one, OK? I've been doing this for 20 years. That's how much fun this job is. I mean, this job is so much fun that for 20 years, you're willing to come in at 3 o'clock in the morning and break out fish. I mean, it's, it's a neat job. Brent, are you ready? Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Start filling buckets. Every bucket is portioned. We got a lot left before this is done. <laughs> And these fishy superstars have a big appetite. We deliver 1,800 pounds to Shamu Stadium. So we try to have all our fish to Shamu by 5.30 at the latest in the morning. And then we deliver to Sea Lion and Otter, Pinniped, all the different areas in the park. But JP doesn't save any for his own grill. I, I'm highly allergic to seafood, so I, I don't eat seafood. It's an interesting little fact. Well, you take down the one if you want. I mean, I can leave Brennan here to keep going. I'll deliver. This isn't the end of JP's day. He'll be back for the lunchtime shift.
just six hours into the day, and across the park, catering supplies are streaming in. operations warehouse. What we're standing in is actually our receiving dock and right over here behind us is where we have our truckloads that come in 365 days a year. We get up to three truckloads a day. It's a non-stop operation. This is a massive warehouse. So like this aisle here is all of our plate goods that you're going to see. It's all of our cups, um, all of our bowls, all of our plates. Um, you know we also have a, an off-site property that can house some of this backup force as well. This is our, part of our refrigeration cooler. It's also a cold storage receiving dock. You'll see the big doors behind you. We get cold storage receiving in here, and each bay houses the different products. So this is our produce cooler, our dairy cooler, and then our meat cooler. Three teams work around the clock to keep the park's kitchen cabinets fully stocked. We've picked the orders at 8 o'clock the day before. So. They're loading those on trucks at 3 o'clock in the morning and they're delivering it out to the park because we have to be ready to go no later than 11 o'clock. It takes that long. Hitting the right mark on this shopping list every day takes more than luck. It comes with years of experience. Good. Are you coming in? No? All right. Thanks. All right. Good. I started when I was 15 years old and I lived, lived around the corner from SeaWorld Orlando and my mom said, you need to go get a job. I came over here and, um, and I applied for a position and I got it. And I remember going home and telling my grandfather, who's long, you know, long passed on at this point, that I got a job. He thought I was joking. He's like, there's no way. You're 15. No way. And to this day, my grandmother just cries when she sees the position I'm in. You know, says your grandfather would be so proud. He'd be so proud of you. I love it. I stay because of the people. And one of her earliest jobs was working the park's legendary barbecue. So I actually smoked all of the, the ribs and the chicken and the brisket. And I got up and I cleaned all the hoods in my pit outfit. Kathy's shift no longer starts at midnight. But with an operation on this scale, she's prepared for anything. The theme park business, it's not a nine to five business. It's not holidays off, that's our peak time. In less than three hours, the park doors open. That puts extra pressure on the bakery, because one of the first items on the menu is breakfast. It's 7 a.m., and Chef Hector has clocked in. First stop, helping out at the bakery. We make everything in-house. So for breakfast, we make it over here, from our croissants to our danish to our different muffins, the sugar-free muffins. And not forgetting cookies. I need 10,000 cookies today. It's already eight hours into the day, but preparation isn't over. Another kitchen is working on its daily inventory. Everything is all about candies and chocolate over here. You know, in the annual basis, we do about 20,000 pounds of fudge. Every month, a new fudge flavor hits the shelves. For the summer, I go for the watermelon. Watermelon is something different, something that is unique. Because we're in Florida, we love watermelon, and we this is the season for the watermelon. We're all about having fun, you know, creating something new with the candy, and at the same time, just having a good time doing it. There you go. Would you like to do it? There you go, just like this. <laughs> and it's like that. And that's our fudge. A few steps away, the bakery delivers their first batch of the day. Just in time.
It's quiet now, but those gates are about to open. So is breakfast. And it's not just pastries on the menu. We also offer hot breakfast, and a lot of our guests like to go down and get a nice big breakfast before they start their day in the park. Park's been open for an hour. It's time to move that barbecue to the grill. This is a carousel style smoker. Where we'll smoke all our chicken and all our meats. We have a combination of baby back ribs, spare ribs, chicken, and as well as our brisket. We use a blend of hickory and oak wood that we smoke with. Those woods actually give you the best blend of flavors. So we do about a two hickory to one oak combination. Um, oak really is gonna give it that darker tone to the meat, the hickory itself is gonna give it the more flavor. Hickory wood comes from the walnut family. It infuses a pungent bacon-like flavor. Chicken usually takes between two and two and a half hours. Um, after that first run comes out, we throw a second run in, maybe a third run, even a fourth run, depending on the business of the day. We will keep one burning 24 hours a day because we have the, uh, the brisket that goes in and it actually, since it's a 10 hour cooking process, it cooks through the night into the next morning. The park's kitchens will soon open for lunch. By 11 o'clock, we're full-blown operation. You know, we've got to have everything open in the park. All casual dining operations are going to open up, and our full-service operations are going to open up. All the reservations for the day are going to be, you know, checked in. As Santos battles his barbecue. Buddy, let's, let's wait all the way to the end for the chicken season. Executive chef Hector Colon is still on the move. I like to visit each restaurant every day. Sometimes it's impossible just because I got so many. Let's wait, let's wait all the way to the M4 because they got a, a fillet. Wow. You got to dig it down. Just hold off for that cut a little bit because it's going off for that medium rare fillet and you just put it on. This is the kitchen for Shark's Underwater Grill. the park's premier full-service restaurant. But don't, don't smash it like that. Just want to leave it fresh. Share on the top. You know you don't. Organization is the key to an efficient kitchen. Basically, by station, it's just I like call it, uh, everything that is, needs to be fried is one station. Everything needs to be in the grill or in the broil is another station. Everything needs to be sauteed is on one station. Sometimes on one station, you have chicken, you have fish, or you have meat. But you're doing the plates that come from each different uh, equipment in the kitchen. So we don't want to have everything mixed up together. at Voyages. That barbecue has hit the grill. But it's still a step away from the plate. First, the preparation. And here's how the masters do it. We're gonna start our caramelizing process. Uh, we start off with our racks of ribs laying on our grill. Go ahead and take some sauce, sauce at the top. We like a heavy coat of sauce on our ribs. Nice glazed look. It basically candies the meat as we're cooking it on the grill. So you'll have the nice dark char marks on it, giving you that sweetness in our sauce. After that, it'll be placed on a cutting board and cut for service. With the smoke, you, you really have to put it at a low temperature and, and really uh, let your meat cook and 
and get that smoke flavor in there and get tender. Once it's on the grill, it's, it's really all in the sauce. You've got to like the heat to stay in this kitchen. We're grilling here from 10 o'clock in the morning to 10 o'clock at night, so it's about a 12-hour process. We do the most business in this part in this restaurant. Kathy takes this success personally. My favorite restaurant is Voyagers, and I'll tell you why. Because I was part of the design process of Voyagers. Originally, it was pizza, and we found out very quickly that our guests. You know, the food that they come in for is our barbecue. It's our signature food item. The park's visitors are busy enjoying the entertainment. But once the smell of this barbecue hits the air, Voyager's lines will be overflowing. At its busiest time, this single location serves over 1,000 people an hour. Right around noon, 1230, 1 o'clock, we actually uh, start having double show breaks. The park is famous for its shows, from killer whales to comedic sea lions. In peak season, there are over 20 shows every day. But when the entertainment's over, thousands of people will leave the stadiums and head for the food. So, Kathy's top food tip? You know, the best times to come to our restaurants is before noon or after two. Our peak time is lunch. You know, everybody's trying to eat at the same time in the park. Um, if you hit us in between the shows, that's gonna be another peak time. We are a show-driven park, so you're gonna see the shows several thousand people coming out of the stadiums every 30 minutes. So when a show's going on, is the best time to actually eat. You know, so if you've already seen that show, come to the restaurant, because you know the restaurant by it's not gonna be that busy. So you can enjoy dinner, you can enjoy lunch, and then you can catch that show later at a later time. Those are the best tips for culinary. Less than 12 hours into the day, and the culinary team have already cooked its way through a truckload of pastries and a mountain of meat and there's still 10 hours before the park closes. While Santos prepares for the crowds, the park's performers grab a snack of their own. But this time, the guests get to do the feeding. By the end of the day, these dolphins will eat 300 kilograms of fish. but the killer whales take the bulk of the day's feed. They'll get through JP's buckets in no time. In a single day, this pod can devour half a ton of fish. That's the weight of two male lions. The lines begin to grow at Voyagers. But it's not the only eatery with a lunchtime rush. Spice Mill, which is probably our most popular, aside from our barbecue restaurant located in the waterfront. And that serves our hamburger and french fries, very popular with our guests. Um, you know, at times we can have lines out the door. Each restaurant has its own prep area. It's another of Kathy's passions. It's about quality. That's why. You know, we want, we want to make sure that what we do is transparent to the guests. We don't want a big production house in the back where things are coming from one centralized kitchen. We want things made fresh right in front of our guests daily so you can see the food being produced right in front of your eyes. Spice Mill has more on offer than just barbecue. So a lot of the trends that we're seeing today and what guests are asking for is more healthy alternatives. You know, we're seeing a lot of uh, vegan requests. We're seeing a lot of requests for kid-friendly, um, smaller portions. And we certainly keep up to speed with those type of things. And special dietary needs. 
we'll be happy to prepare a meal for any type of allergy in our park. Our entire leadership team has been trained on how to handle allergens. Yes, I'm allergic to dairy. Yeah, so I'm just trying to figure out what my options are. Let me show you over here real quick. This is something that we have for all the restaurants in the park. It's Karen McAllister's job to make sure every allergic eventuality is covered. Common allergens would be dairy, wheat, soy, tree nuts, peanuts, fish, eggs, to name a few. We have allergen binders that are tools that our leadership can use in every facility um, that help guide them through the specific menus and recipes and guide them through options for guests depending on the type of allergy that they have. Yeah, okay, great. I appreciate your help. And she personally understands how unusual they can be. I do, actually. Um, crazy enough, I'm allergic to strawberries. But allergies or not, there's always plenty of comfort food. In a single year, this park gets through 100 tons of hamburgers and nearly 600 tons of fries. We'll get in a truckload of French fries on a weekly basis. We actually have a backup truckload of French fries waiting. Another favorite at this destination, desserts. From an assortment of muffins to croissants to chocolate dip cookies to cupcakes, I mean, you're going to see it all. You know, red velvet cake, specialty cake of the month, um, chocolate chocolate cake, chocolate terry cake, cheesecakes of all the varieties. We even let our, our pastry chef come up with different um, you know, pastry of the month. So you're gonna see a specialty things in there every time you come to the park. Twelve hours into the day, and the bakery is still cranking out those pastries. And they don't just have a special dough machine to cope with the load. They also have special ovens. Well, sometimes when you cook at home, you get the half of the cake is a little rice and half of the cake is a little low. So that's what we do it over here. We try to rotate it so it cooking is a little even. And we're doing a 3 tos carrot cake. We're really proud about our carrot cake. Uh, when we serve a piece of carrot cake, they always say, uh, mm, it's our best cake that you have. But these are carrot cake, it is excellent. You know, in between every, every single cake, I love the carrot cake. Each cake is decorated by her. And for every cake, we got a whipped cream. So basically, during the day, I would say we make whipped cream at least two or three times a day. But the park also has some vegetarians to cater for. Outside, JP is delivering salad. But this isn't headed for the restaurants. It's for the park's manatees. JP is back on feeding duty. We provide all our manatees um, the natural ways of eating, and one of them is eating off the bottom. So here at SeaWorld, since we don't have seagrass growing off the bottoms, what we've made are trays that allow the lettuce to go on. It's got a weight on it, and it just sinks it to the bottom of the exhibit so they can go down and continue to do their natural foraging off the bottom. On an average day here at SeaWorld, we're going to go through about 
20 to 25 cases of lettuce a day. We get deliveries twice a week. I'm looking at somewhere, anywhere from 100 to 120 cases a week that we feed out to all our manatees. And it's top quality. We use a whole different variety of lettuce. We use spinach, leaf lettuce, romaine lettuce. Sweet potatoes work really well for us. Um, sometimes we use mixed spring. Um, other times we might get into using cabbage. On average, a manatee is gonna eat 10% of its body weight a day. So if you look at a 1,500 pound animal, 10%, 150 pounds a day of just lettuce. You know, we feed them throughout the day, so they continue to forage like they would in the wild. In the wild, they're not gonna eat all day. They're gonna move around, they're gonna come back, they're gonna forage for a little bit. So we try to replicate that to the best of our ability. It's mid-afternoon. There's still six hours to park closing. As Voyager's winds down, Shark's underwater grill heats up. It's almost time for dinner. How is everyone doing today? Good, we're all ready to have a good day, right? Yeah. All right, just some things we're gonna cover today. Um, we do have a VIP group coming in. Um, it's a party of 10. They're gonna sit at table 70 in the corner over there in section nine. Um, Skip, you're gonna be serving them today. A um, Couple things, we have haddock for our fish of the day today. Uh, minestrone is our soup along with lobster bisque. Um, and then our vegetable medley um, for our vegetable for the day. Shark's underwater grill is the park's fine dining experience. You know, there, there's always going to be a place for a fine dining and full service, particularly in the theme park. You have all different type, types of, of guests in the park, from, you know, your grab-and-go to your grazers, to those that actually want to sit down and enjoy a dining experience. And that's where Shark's fits in. You know, it's not just a full-service restaurant. It's, a, it's, it's an experience. When you walk into Shark's underwater grill, you see from floor to ceiling sharks. You know, it, it's not something you're going to see anywhere else in the world. We're really proud of it because this is the only place that you can come, relax, sit down, nice air conditioner, plus have it run the few view out of the shark tank. It may not be on the scale of voyages, but this restaurant still has to make the pace. Manager of this establishment, Mike Frasca. Typically here we do about 120 covers an hour. Um, so in a 10 hour day we do about 11 to 1200 covers a day. And it's not just people that eat here. Someone has to keep those sharks happy. Each of the shark species will eat the same thing, uh, so it's, it makes it very easy for us to establish a menu for the sharks during the feedings. They'll get fed a variety of foods, like herring, mackerel, jacks, uh, squid. They'll eat just about anything, and they certainly have their favorites. Salmon would be one of those examples of one of the food items they really enjoy. The sharks are fed only twice per week, and that may not seem like a lot, but actually, if you think about it, these are cold-blooded animals. Therefore, they don't have the same energy requirements as mammals do. Back in the kitchen, Chef is looking to update some menu items with Kathy's help. So basically this is a trio of a little bit of something that we put a little bit different types of uh, anchors that we do over here at Shark. I have the sweet potato with the vegetables and the pork shrimp. I have the grilled salmon with the uh, uh, sauteed spinach, with the uh, uh, blue cheese fondue, and I have the ravioli with oriental vegetables and a full wine demi. Okay. So basically it's a trio, surf and turf. Nice. How about of a different entrees that we provide over here. Nice. Like charts. You have the short ribs, ravioli. Right. You have the tempura shrimp, plus you have the grilled salmon. It's a sample platter. It is a trio platter. You got three different kinds of meat. 
and uh, basically you use it to see food. Contrary to popular myth, SeaWorld doesn't supply its own seafood. We get that all the time, and the answer is no. <laughs> no, we don't, we don't catch our own fish and serve it in our restaurants. Um, no, all of our seafood is sustainable. All of our fisheries are certified through that. Um, so, you know, it's, it's very regulated, and it's something that we're very proud of for sustainability efforts. Okay, I'm going to let you cut that one up. We'll try that. <laughs> all right, good. That's really good. Very good. Very nice. These new dishes will hit the plate soon. But there's one menu item that's ever popular. Steak. And even this staple gets the chef treatment. It's a one pound revive steak. Let's see. I'm just going to put a little fresh vegetables on it. And I'm going to finish them up with a little bit of a uh, demi-glaze. Basically, it's a reduction of veal bones and stock with some red wine. And this is our gaucho steak. Basically, it's a 16 on ribeye steak, bone-in with uh, fresh vegetables and potatoes. Like chef, Kathy likes to take a tour of the park's eateries. Every day, I interact with the managers and the frontline team members. It's a portion of my day every day. You know, I, I can't sit behind my desk, and that's not me. So can you walk me through the dining room and, and show me how, how your layout's doing? My role is to be out in the park. We have thousands of guests coming through the front door, and, you know, we have all these restaurants in the park. It's my job to be out there to make sure that things are running smoothly. Good evening. Even to this day, I love to get out and actually get behind the lines at times. I have to force myself not to. Um, you know, because it's just so, so much fun to jump in there and talk to the guests and move the lines and do it yourself. Right now, those lines are quiet. That can only mean one thing. It's almost showtime. To beat the Florida heat, there's a host of cold snacks to enjoy while you watch. Well, they're headed to go to a Shamu show, or they can stop at any location, any of our marketplace locations that we offer churros, hot dogs, uh, popcorn, and uh, various uh, turkey legs as well. We also offer um, Shamu-shaped pretzels as well for our guests, and also Shamu-shaped ice cream bars. Um, that's unique to SeaWorld. One customer favorite is waffle cones. And each one is made by hand. When I started in the park, I worked making waffle cones. You know, at 15 years old, I would make 50 cases of waffle cones a day, rolling these hot waffles. And I came home with, you know, burn tip fingers. Um, we typically go through about 300 a day. We also go through, as a sea roll part, we go through 24,000 gallons of ice cream. And the most popular flavor, chocolate vanilla. The shows are almost over. Time to dine with the park's predators. The shark's kitchen is about to get hot. And Chef is sticking around to lend a hand. 
Running this kitchen takes teamwork. You got to feel any new air coming up? On both sides of the stove. Manager Mike Frasca runs the front of house. And once the server puts the order in, we actually, the way the system works, it goes right to it. We call our expediter on the line in the back kitchen. Um, and at that point, they call out the orders to the rest of the kitchen staff. And Chef and his team run the back. He's, he's receiving the tickets over here from the dining room so they know what to cook. Four stations. Okay? So we have a fry station, we got a saute station, we got an appetizer and salad station, 15 cooks. We have a restaurant chef and we have about four a supervisor and a season supervisor. Runners! Make sure you got like five samples on the grill. Runners! Do I gotta bake cheese? Out front, Mike takes a personal interest in his customer's satisfaction. Good afternoon, folks. How is everything today? Steak great. prepared to your liking? Awesome. Very How are the salads? Good? You having yeah. a good day today? Yeah. Awesome. Thank Enjoy. Thank you. You're welcome. So we speak with guests, each and every guest that come in. Let's make sure their experience is what they expected. You got two more filet, uh, two more salmons in the grill. Three salmons all day. I'm going to let me get on. Do you have a, re a shrimp ravioli as appetizer? The pace in this kitchen won't stop until the very last meal is served. It's been 21 hours since the culinary department started their day. And it's not over yet. Most kitchens close by 9 p.m., but the park doesn't. There's still a fireworks show to enjoy. Finally, guests head home. And the big cleanup begins. Today, Mike's the one seeing it through to the end. As the closing duty manager for the culinary operations department, we're responsible for walking around the entire park, checking all the operations, checking in with each and every supervisor um, from each operation, make sure there's no concerns with any team members, product issues, or guest issues. Um, once we check in with all of the operations throughout the park, um, we are the contact until 30 minutes after the park closes um, each and every night. And then at that point, we check out with each closing supervisor, and they close and shut down their operations, make sure that their areas are clean and good to go for the end of the night. It's really kind of buttoning up the night, right? And so that's what it is. It's cleaning, facility integrity, and then it's going home. Roughly, we finish um, on, like, for a night like tonight, we're on a 10 o'clock park close. We're out of here between 10.30 and 11 o'clock. As the duty manager, some of our leadership is in the park till 11, 30, 12 o'clock, finishing all their closing operations. As Mike leaves, tomorrow's crew arrives to start the cycle all over again. And the first job, get that barbecue smoking.